Well, yes, welcome to church. My name is Tim. I'm one of the pastors here. We have begun these last two weeks doing something new that you might not know about. Uh, in the olden days, we would pre-record a lot of the things that were happening online. And now, starting last week, we do two things. One is we're still pre-recording things that will live online all week long. But we are inviting people from around the world right into our room at 9 and 11. We, this service now goes live to uh, our website. And so if you're watching from somewhere like Seattle or Minneapolis or Desert Hot Springs, welcome. Uh, glad to have you. Not to brag on you, but um, it's, it's going to cool off this week. It's going to be about 107. Um, it's going to be pickleball all day, every day. So welcome to our service. We're glad that you've joined us. Uh, those of you here in the room, we're glad you joined us as well. Um, don't tell them that it is, you know, a balmy 38% humidity, which to us is right next to death. Uh, but we're going to make it. I promise we will. We always do. Uh, welcome to church. We are in a series called Summer Road Trip, and it is a brief look at the entire Bible. And the idea of the summer road trip is a lot like we used to do with our own kids growing up. We got a lot of kids and growing up, we would drive from our home here in Southern California up to visit my wife's family in Seattle, maybe somebody online right now, uh, up in Seattle. And so our kids would see the entire state of California in uh, the first 12 hours of that drive. And so my kids would kind of learn like, wow, there's you know the beaches uh, down in Southern California, and then there's the desert, and then there's the Central Valley, and they would be grateful. When we would hit Bakersfield, they'd be grateful for where we lived. Um, and I'm sorry, if you're from Bakersfield, I don't want to tell you. Uh, and then after the Central Valley, you hit that Sacramento area, and then after Sacramento, you've got Northern California, which just feels different again. I mean, I want to make a joke about weed, California, but I won't. Once you're, once you're north of that, you pop, you know, into Southern Oregon, Ashland and the Shakespeare Festival, and you're, you know, in the Pacific Northwest. And so what's kind of cool is even though my kids haven't lived very many places, they've got a general sense of the West Coast of the United States. Well, we hope moving the speed that we are these five weeks through the Bible, you're not going to become an expert at the nuanced difference between Bakersfield and Clovis. You're not, but hopefully you get a general sense that gives you more confidence so that instead of avoiding the Bible uh, on your own and just waiting for a pastor to talk about it, that you're like, you know what? I'm going to grab a book of the Bible and I'm going to go over to the new Chick-fil-A and those two and a half hours, I'm going to wait for my chicken in the drive through <laughs> I'm going to crack out some of the Bible all on my very own. And so one of just this simple concept is so helpful to people did you know that the Bible is organized like a library? And the collections of books have similarities with each other. The first chunk that we moved you through are the first five books. And it's called the Law, or the Torah, or the Pentateuch. Why? Because we like to jack around with you. At pastor's school, we all had a meeting, and we're like, listen, we don't have real-world skills. So we've got to make the Bible as confusing as we can to people, so they have to... So they have to ask us questions and not read it on their own. Listen, all you got to know, and then the first five books of the Bible, God talks about the way he wants the world to be and what happened when he set it in our hands to run with it. Spoiler alert, it didn't go great. <laughs> and so then the next section in your Bible are the books of history. It's the history of what the nation of Israel did with the law. So first five books, the way it's meant to be. The next chunk of books, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, 1st, 2nd, all of those books are just stories. It's centuries and centuries of what the people did with the expectations. And lo and behold, it wasn't that great. So you've got this collection of books in your Bible, the books of poetry, Song of Solomon, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, uh, Job, and the book of Psalms. And this is a collection of works. It's a lot of poetry and actually some fictional drama uh, that talks about how we think and feel about how things are going. And it's really expressive. It's all over the place. I used the phrase last week. It's like as emotional as a 13-year-old girl at a Harry Styles concert. The emotions are all over the place in the books of poetry. 
Then you get to the books of the prophets. The prophets are people who would speak to others on behalf of God. Not hooky spooky, not hard to understand. People who would speak to others on behalf of God. And this is where you've got all the weird like Italian sounding names like Malachi and like Ezekiel and all that, right? Jeremiah, Isaiah, Nahum, like all of these um, different books are now commentary from God to how things were going based on how he wanted them to be. So there's a lot of continuity across the whole Old Testament. But if you're anything like me, you're reading through and you're picking up on these little things that are unfamiliar to you. And I'm going to tell you right now, when you read literature, it's either really easy to follow or really hard to follow based on two ultra simple ingredients that we actually don't give enough attention to. The names of the characters and the places where they happen. So some of you in this room, if I were to talk about Cal L, you instantly know what I'm talking about. I just jumped literary genre, didn't I? And there's like four of us in this room that Cal L is actually right from the world of the Superman universe. That's, that's, yeah, right, that's what I'm talking about. Some of you are like, Cal L, what Bible book is that? No, it's not. It's the fictional name of this alien from the planet Krypton. And you know, like, anyway, it doesn't matter. People get nervous about all the weird sounding names in the Old Testament. So we just kind of reduce it to kings and battles and bible stuff. But what's really weird is then when you go from the Old Testament to what we're going to do today, the Gospels, it feels like two different books. It's like two different gods. The characters radically change. In large part, we're more comfortable with the New Testament because like, I know a dude named Matthew and I named my kid Mark and my brother's name is Luke. Like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Rome. We're so familiar with these names and places that it's like, whew, okay, I'm glad the Bible settled down and got real because like, I know what's going on. But wait a second though. Has that ever bugged you why it feels so weird in the old and so normal in the new? And how is there any connection from this group of books to suddenly this group, which we're going to talk about today, the Gospels? If you'll give me nine minutes, I promise I'll make a really great connection between what happened in the old and what's going on in the new. So I'm going to move all of this out of the way and not spill it, engage the core. Oh, all right. So over here, you've got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Really, the two big core stories of the first five are Genesis and the Exodus story, okay? This is the intent of God in the world. And then you've got all these books of history, how it's going. King David and King Solomon and King Ahab and King Hezekiah and, you know, all of that. And this is like during the Bronze Age of history. By the time you get to the end of the Old Testament, you've got a mix now. Israel is largely deported. Israel is almost exclusively prisoners of war. They are not living at home. They're gone. The very last kingdom in the Old Testament to take over everybody you actually know about. Well, hold on. No, let's start with them. Uh, you ever hear of the, the movie 300? It's based off a real story in history, the 300 Spartans. The movie's based off a graphic novel, and the graphic novel's based off of real history. I have stood on the battlefield of Thermopylae, and Persia was this kingdom at the end, okay? Persia's in the movie 300. We'll get there in a minute. Persia is uh, defeated Babylon they're in charge of the whole known world. And this Persian king, Cyrus the Great, if you listen to Dan Carlin podcasts on history, he calls him Karush. King Cyrus of Persia brings some Jewish leaders into his throne room. And he's like, you know what? I'd rather you guys went back to your land and do the stuff you're good at because I will make more money off taxes if you go home. And so they actually give the Jewish people some money. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah is the very tail end. It's King Cyrus, Persia. We have this history in the world. This is not fiction. Sends them back. Well, that's where the Bible stops writing things down. And you've got 500 years before Jesus shows up over at that end of our timeline, okay? If you haven't figured out, I'm on a timeline. The stage starts in Genesis over there and we're working forward. Well, Persia is in charge for a while, 
But that battle of 300, the movie 300, the Spartans, Persia and Greece start to have beef. And there is this dude. He's the son of a king. And that king is also a general, Philip of Macedon. He's pretty tough. And his son is insane. Not, well, yes, but Alexander the Great is remarkable. I mean, sorry to say it that way, but he's incredible. And Alexander starts to conquer kingdom after kingdom after kingdom. He defeats the Persians. He rules from Greece to India. And if you pull out your Google Maps and like you're going to have to keep zooming out from Greece till India finally makes it onto your map. You know what's in between Greece and India? Israel is. And Israel winds up conquered by them. And they're like, dang, we just got moved back from the Persians and now the Greeks are in charge. Well, take one teeny half step past Alexander. Alexander conquered so much that when he died, no one was strong enough to rule it all. Remember when Apple, like Steve Jobs, and when Steve Jobs died, everyone's like, I don't know if anyone can keep leading this. Okay, multiply that by thousands and thousands. Nobody can rule Greece, so they split it into four kingdoms. And Israel, unfortunately, is just right in between two of these kingdoms. I got too many kids. We had four kids. That was, I don't know what we were thinking, right? And when you put us all in the van to go on these long summer road trips, our proximity to each other is just too close. There's not enough hot Cheetos and Code Red Mountain Dew at a gas station to keep us happy for an 18-hour drive. There's friction because of the proximity. And so there's just fights. I know you think my kids are perfect. God bless you for that. But they're unfortunately tremendously regular kids. And they would get in fights. Poor Israel. They were right on the edge of these two kingdoms that were split at the end of Alexander's rule. And man, back and forth. Who's in charge? What's the new rule? Who do we pay taxes to? And can we be free? And now they move forward through history a little bit more. And that kingdom started to get weak. And there was another group on the horizon Dude, they were rugged and rough. The Romans, oh, they were just so aggressive, so aggressive. And right that first century, right before Jesus, the last hundred years rolling up to him, the Romans take charge of a lot of stuff, including Jerusalem. Okay, I just walked you through 500 years. And you've got to understand, it's 500 years of frustration. When are we getting back to when it used to be like King David was here? Things were so good then. God was with us and we were with him. But who the heck is in charge and why are we not getting restored? And what about our independence? What about our pride? What about our freedom? And the Romans do something to maintain control that really changes the cultural tenor in Jerusalem. They desecrate the temple. Now, we don't use the word desecrate in our culture because there's not a lot holy in our culture. There just isn't. We get in dumb Twitter beefs that last 17 hours and then we move on to the next fight. There's nothing enduringly valuable to us. For the Jewish people, the temple had an enduring value. And for a Roman general to try and drop the hammer, he goes into the temple and he desecrates it. Let me try and explain to you the emotional response. We had one year that was really hard for church. During COVID restrictions, it was frustrating. Uh, do we only meet online? You know what? We think that from what we've been reading, meeting outside, good airflow, let's meet outside. And what was really great about that one year is no matter what we did, so many people were mad at us. It was a special time to be a church and a pastor. How dare you meet outside? That's not safe for people. How dare you not open the doors and put them inside? How dare you do this? And I'm like, oh my gosh, just because I think it's our goal to make everyone mad and sad at us at all times. And that year was hard. Imagine 500 years of inconsistency. What are we allowed to do? Who's calling the shots? What are the rules today? Mask plus shot, no shot, no mask. What are we allowed? Grocery stores are open early. What's happening? 500 years of that, you would lose your mind. I happen to know because I got a lot of emails that indicate some of you wouldn't last five years. <laughs> 500 years of uneven leadership, 500 years of when are we getting back to what God's got for us? And then this Roman general walks into the building and he desecrates it. 
So as a church, we're trying to hang on and read the train and follow the rules and whatever. 500 years go by and this business person comes through and they just buy us out of our building. And they set up a pornography shop in this building. And in the main room, there's big screens everywhere. You go and purchase different types. And then you go out around the room, the building, and you use the rooms for whatever you're using for. If you watched that happen, your heart would break or your heart would be In the words of Kip, the brother of Napoleon, a little T.O.'d. The Jewish people over here in first century before Jesus, they break. And they just lead a bloody revolt. As a matter of fact, that Maccabean revolt, that people group in Israel, that they actually win. And to this day, the the festival, the the, the holiday of Hanukkah goes back to this moment. So if it's ever felt to you like, Why does the Old Testament talk about things and then the New Testament talk about things, but they just feel so different? It's because the people had been changed. 500 years of this changed them. I can't even imagine 500 years of different pandemic restrictions, but that's what they went through. And so if you're confused going from Old Testament to New, you're not dumb. You just have never been taught that 530 years of human history changed things. And there's a couple key things that I want to teach you about that are important. One, it's a split culture. It's a culture that is a mix now of like political secular and people of faith. Have you ever wondered why in church, hey Tim, why do you pastors say when you're reading the Bible, sometimes you say in the Greek it says, Oh, look at me, great poupon. Why are you trying to sound intellectual? Why are you trying to sound like you know more? It's because of Alexander the Great. He changed the world so dramatically, even though he's 300 years before Jesus, by the time you get to the Gospels, the four books that were written about the person of Jesus, if you want to speak to people in the world, you speak Greek. So they wrote it down in Greek. So we're not trying to sound cool. We're actually trying to communicate a first century idea to a 21st century world. So if you've ever wondered, why the heck, why the Greek? It's because of Alexander. It's because of what happened in between the old and the new. A second thing I want you to know is this. It's why all of a sudden in the New Testament there are synagogues and Pharisees and Sadducees and lawyers. Like what is going on? The whole religious system in the Old Testament, Tim, it feels like they just dropped it. Like it's just gone and it's just new. Why do we have Pharisees and not priests? 500 years of changing, of changing, of changing. If you can't go to temple, what do you do? Well, they invented the synagogue and these different groups come about. And all of this life changed and it really pressed on them one of two questions. Standing over here in the first century, if you are a person of faith living in Israel, you had two ideas. Number one, Do we fight to go back to the way it used to be in the books of history? And let's just get back to like with King David. That was our peak. Or there were the other idea was, let's just get on board. We tried to fight it with the Persians and meh. We tried to fight it with the Greeks, meh. We tried to fight it with the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, meh. Guys, the Romans are here. I don't know what to tell you. It's not going back. We're delusional. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Those are your two options, fight to get back or do as the Romans do. It's this, (laughs) watch this, do we try and conserve our history or do we just progress forward into the new way of the world? You had a conservative view and you had a progressive view. (laughs) And Jesus shows up to that fight right there. (laughs) That's really like encouraging to hear because apparently whatever he did then, we can listen to now. Because I don't know if you've noticed, but on the Twitter, it's a little bit spicy out there. And this isn't exactly our finest moment in human history. And with all of this, the gospel authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, sat down to write about Jesus. Gospels work to record the life, the ministry, and the person of Jesus. That's it. Make it simple. Gospels aren't tricky. They're not hoogie spooky. They just seek to clarify Jesus. And they clarify him with three priorities in mind. One, two, three. The first is this, Jesus as a man. Uh, It's almost 
It's almost a no-duh thing for me to say in church because I think most of human history is comfortable with this concept, but you've got to understand that the gospel authors aren't just trying to write about Jesus as a man. When they're doing things, like if you were writing about Jesus, you might not stop to write down when he ate. You just wouldn't. You wouldn't stop to write down when he took a nap because to our culture, either Jesus is something you're cynical of or you've given your life to, There's a lot of normal things in the Gospels. Have you ever even considered how normally they write about him? But really what they're trying to push you towards is two other ideas. One, that Jesus functioned a lot of the times as a prophet. Oh, Tim, there's one of your Bible words. You're doing that passive thing again where you're trying to just juke me into thinking you're smarter than I am. I promise you I'm not. I promise you I'm not. You can like look at the history of the TikToks I've liked. I'm a dumb man. But a prophet is someone who speaks to people on behalf of God. I speak to people on behalf of God. And I live in a culture where you brought a device with you into church that sits in your back pocket or your purse or you've got it face up on silent on your lap right now. And all week long, you've got a different feed tuned in to keep in touch with what they said. Maybe it's your Twitter feed. Maybe it's your news app. But we live in a day and age where nobody gives us information anymore. People give us opinions. And our newscasters assign value. And all week long, they cherry pick things in different stories to assign value to change your mind. When the gospel writers sat down to write about Jesus, one of the things that impressed them is that Jesus spoke with authority to people as if he knew the truth. You guys remember in the Sermon on the Mount, what is that, Matthew 5, 6, and 7? Jesus used this phrase, you heard it said, but I say to you. (laughs) Do you know the pressure it is to check my Twitter feed and my news feed and know what MSNBC, to know what Tucker Carlson, to know what Joe Rogan said this week, and to go, wow, what I read in Scripture this week is different than all of that. But I've got 2,000 people, I've got 3,000 people that they're gonna listen and they're gonna weigh what I say against 24-7 news cycle. And I'm telling you, it weighs on us as communicators. Sometimes in a bad way, sometimes in a good way. But the gospel writers, what they remember about Jesus is like, man, he spoke like a prophet. He just said, yeah, yeah, I know that you've heard it said. Here's what I say about it. He was a young dude He was 30 when he started his ministry. I'm 45, and sometimes I feel too young to speak to this culture. And some of you are thinking, wow, 45, you don't look 40. God bless you for that. Thank you for that. (laughs) Roll back the clock on me 15 years ago. I looked like I was 12, (laughs) y'all. Jesus is speaking as a 30-year-old to his culture, and he's just saying, yeah, I know that you've got your own preferred media outlet. I get that. And I know that they're a multi-million dollar company that keeps giving you their opinions 24-7 with graphics and everything. Here's just what God says. Second thing that the gospel authors did is they presented Jesus as a king. There are very specific stories. For example, the way Jesus enters Jerusalem at the end, it's an image of both the Old Testament kings and actually it's borrowing from the contemporary Roman general conquering But whatever, Um, they presented Jesus as a king. There are some scriptures. When the gospel authors are referencing Jesus, sometimes they'll reference the prophets. Sometimes they'll reference some of the words of David in the Psalms. And sometimes they would reference the books of history as well. And some of their clips, some of their quotes, they're trying to affirm, man, You guys want a kingdom that looks like David, and I'm trying to teach you that this king is just different. It's just going to look different because his kingship is bigger than David. And these two offices of prophet and king can call us to something in the day and age we live in because I understand the pressure of walking out of this room and checking that feed. I really do. And the calling to us is to treat Jesus the man like the leader that the gospels present him to be. And you've got a hard call to make. Do you stay as loyal to your preference of news? 
Or do you try and say, I'll stay informed, but my loyalty is gonna be with Jesus. And out of that loyalty, I'll speak back to that culture that's devouring itself. But whatevs, I gotta keep moving. The second thing that the gospels present Jesus as, as God, okay? The gospels just assume Jesus is God. I am, you're gonna be bothered by what I'm about to say, but I am the perfect age to settle a debate that our culture has. And I'm sorry if you're older than me, you're like, no, you're too young and you don't know things yet. I believe that. Uh, and I, I know that some of you are like, mm, Grandpa, you have to ask your kids how to update your phone, don't you? Mm, I accept that as well. But my age is absolutely perfect to know the right answer to a debate our country has. You see, as a 45-year-old, Ricky Jenkins and Tim Cool have grown up almost the exact same number of months in this world. And what that lifespan has given me is the tail end of Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, the entire career of Michael Jordan, the entire career of Kobe Bryant, and I will live long enough to watch the entire career of LeBron James. And there's a debate in our culture over who the greatest of all time is. And if anything, you need to go back and watch clips of Larry Bird, because if anything, that man is underrated. He's, a, he's just a beast. We think of him as the goofy three-point shooter, shooter. He, he, whatever. Um, then I watched 1984 on Michael Jordan, and we're just gonna forget the wizard years, right? Like, I watched Michael Jordan. Um, I watched Kobe Bryant. I would understand, by the way, if you were younger than me and you think Kobe is the man, because Kobe is a man. Like, he's, like his body of work is just impressive. And I don't know why it's popular to hate on LeBron James, you hate on him with your Twitter quotes to his face. I've watched him in person. That man is seven foot 13, built from bricks, and he can turn on a dime at full speed. I'm telling you right now, the hate for LeBron James is just dumb. However, I've seen all of these things in front of mine own eyes, and I move through life assuming that everyone knows that Michael Jordan is the greatest of all times. It just, it's just... <laughs> We got some other babies who were born in the 70s and no. Um, it's just, it's like self-evident. I don't have to argue it. I just know it, right? Okay, that exact mindset, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, by the time they're gonna sit down and write about Jesus, they assume his divinity. It's an assumption they have. And so as you read the gospels, you've gotta understand that they assume, well, okay, everyone Everyone knows that that's what Jesus thinks of himself. And that's what those of us who believe, we believe he's God. But I know that there are some of you that did not get to watch the 80s and 90s basketball. You might not know. And so what the gospel authors do is they assume and they argue the divinity of Jesus, the God-centeredness of it. And there's two primary ways that they argue for the divinity of Jesus. Number one is the miracles. The miracles are one of the ways that the gospel writers are telling stories, not just like, oh, this is cool, or oh, we hope you come to our harvest fest, or oh, I hope I get more clicks on my social media. A miracle was a story recorded to affirm, to cry out, this dude is different than every other communicator. And I don't care if you want to go back to David or ahead with Rome, it doesn't matter, Jesus is different. And in our culture, it's one of those sticking points where if you're a believer, you believe in myth, legend, and fairy tales. But for me, as a person of faith, the miracles are one of the things that pulls my heart all the way in to who Jesus is. Because again, the assumption from the gospel writers is that he's God. But they know they've got to talk you into it. And then the second way that they affirm this is not just the miracles, but the message. The message as well. So Jesus, as a 31-year-old teacher, is out talking, and he's challenging the establishment. He just is. And oh my gosh, literally me mentioning in church, Rachel Maddow or Tucker Carlson, I know as I'm talking, someone is going to email me later this week, I promise you, and say, yeah, but Tim, Rachel Maddow is representing the compassionate heart of Jesus, or Tucker Carlson is representing the, you know, the order and structure of Jesus. And I'm just like, oh, I'm gonna get it this week. I know I am. Well, Jesus is teaching and the religious authorities are there and they don't email later. Back in the olden days, they would stand up in the crowd and they would challenge. And uh, Jesus is talking about how his leadership is more important than Abraham. 
And they look at him and they're like, dude, you're not even old enough to have known who Abraham was. Whippersnapper. And Jesus looks back at them and in a crowd, not on a Twitter feed, on a, in a crowd, Jesus over here in the timeline says, before Abraham was, I am. Double attestation. Oh, well, this is my pivot foot. Oh, that's Jordan right there. Because uh, <laughs> turn around, whatever. Um, from here, first century, do you know how many hundreds and thousands of years you got to go back to Abraham? Long time, y'all. So here's the first part of what he did. Okay, well, I know I'm standing here and I'm 31 and I know I look young and you look old, so you should know more than me, but you're getting challenged because I obviously know more than your divided culture knows. And so as I speak it, your confidence is eroding. Let me jack with your confidence more. Before Abraham... Before Abraham, I existed even before that. You want to fight with me about Abraham? Fool, you don't even know. I was before this. And as a matter of fact, before Abraham was, I am. That's a second attestation. Because right here in the Exodus, God says, Moses, I designed my people to be free and they're not. So I'm going to free them with you. And Moses is like, you in what army? And God's like, what do you mean? And he's like, Egypt is superpower." They've got wealth and resources and organization, and they have a pantheon of gods. I know it's not important to you, but back in the old world, when Egypt said, the sun god listens to us, the moon god listens to us, the river god listens to us, all of these gods were more powerful than all of Egypt's wealth and organization. So it wasn't just that Egypt was tangibly impressive, they were spiritually impressive, With all of that power, Moses says, they're going to ask me, why on earth would I listen to you? Because of everything I have, you listen to me. And God tells Moses, tell him this, I am sent you. My existence is more than the sum total of your wealth, your organization, your size, your scope, and your pantheon of gods. I I am. And so, I'll be back in a minute, I'll be back in a minute. Jesus, a 31-year-old dude, says, before Abraham was, I am. The language there in the Bible, Jesus is saying, I'm God. Guys, I'm not just another idea in this culture on what to do politically. I'm telling you that in my prophetic voice, in my authoritative voice, I'm more than that. I'm God. And so now the gospel authors are moving because they're like excited about the fact that he's clear and that he's authoritative and that he's divine. And the third thing that the gospel authors want to teach you is different from all other religions. It's where they kind of go off the rails of other faiths because every faith wants their leader to be impressive. You want Muhammad to be impressive. You want Buddha to be impressive. You want these key leaders to be impressive. But the third thing they teach and it's different, is that Jesus is a savior. And it's just a different religious idea. And man, it's muggy in here and we all gotta be done. But I need to tell you about this. When Jesus is at the Last Supper, the gospel, all of the gospel authors spend a lot of time on the crucifixion. John spends a lot of time at the Last Supper before the crucifixion. And they're just not like... Man, but all your strength and all your Twitter followers and all your like legitimacy to the throne, we're about to get back at it, right? And Jesus says, yeah, here's the thing. We stand in this moment in history and you look back across all those centuries of failure and you think to yourself, I just want to get back to the way it was. And you're looking too shallow. I'm here to get it back to the way it was, that God is with us and there's nothing separating. It's just that you guys are looking at really smaller considerations. I need to solve your sin. And we live in a culture that wants to argue the middle ground. We, we, we wanna live here and Jesus is here to solve an issue that we don't like talking about. And so the most important thing about what the gospel authors present is not as important to us. And so there's a tension point there in our culture. 
And I have been a part of American mega churches my whole life. And I get why we talk about a marriage series and like good communications and like managing your finances because it's all in the scripture. I've read the whole sucker front to back a few times. I read it in the Greek and all of that. It's all in there. But I know that my culture doesn't like to talk about the most important issue. The priority to the gospel writers is the salvation of humanity in the person of Jesus. And at the core of that issue is our sin. Six months ago, seven months ago, my wife was taking our golden retriever on walks. And that dum-dum kept banging her knee. And she thought her ACL was swollen and sprained. So she took two weeks off. And it still hurt. So we went to a doctor and they're like, yeah, it probably is a sprain. Let's check it out. And then they did some imaging and they're like, ah, there's some swelling in there that's abnormal. It might be early onset arthritis. And my, mom, my wife's like, oh, I'm an overachiever. I got early arthritis. And then they did another scan and they're like, ah, actually something's growing in there. And then they did a biopsy and the biopsy was inconclusive. So we drive down to a hospital in San Diego, UCSD, and the head of the department winds up available that day to do the surgical biopsy. And she performs the procedure. Wendy is still under, and I'm in the parking lot of a mall in La Jolla. And she calls me, and she says, Tim, I need you to pay attention right now. It is cancer. And let me tell you, in that moment, two things were true. I did not want to have that conversation. But I was on the phone with someone who could do something about that conversation. And so I paid attention to everything she said. I could walk you back through that conversation word for word right now. And my wife wakes up and we talk her through it. And they're like, okay, doc, what's the plan? You're the one who's discovered the problem. You've diagnosed it. Doc, tell me you can cure it. Yes, I can. Okay, what's it going to cost? It's going to cost a lot. We're going to try chemo first. And I'm going to tell you right now, you're probably not going to walk out of this with both legs. Okay, but doc, will I walk out of this with my wife? We're pretty confident we can save her life. Okay, then you do whatever you need to do to get the death out of my wife. And as we walked through that, she endured some real rough things because we want the rest of our life together. And yeah, we're gonna suffer the consequences of it for the rest of time. The gospel authors say that Jesus is preoccupied with the death that's in us that has led to all the brokenness. The centuries of brokenness are not because they couldn't get themselves together politically. And I know the pull of the pundits. I know the draw of politics in our age. Politics won't solve the death that's in us. And Jesus stands here at the end of the gospels and he says, guys, I need to die because all of that centuries of your brokenness, people are dying. There's death in you. The sin is death. The sin is death. It's why I'm in a body because my body will pay that price. And because I'm God, I defeat it. I'll win. Give me three days with death and it's done. And so the Bible records that he died and then he rose from the dead. And watch this in John chapter 20. I promised you and we're done and I'm not done. Mm. End of the gospel of John. Jesus has risen. And there's some ladies that go to attend to the tomb. And they're like, uh-oh, there ain't no body here. And they go back and they tell the disciples and the disciples are so confused because they're stuck on the two choices. Or should we be conservative or progressive with where we're at in culture? And they say, Jesus is gone. And Peter and John, they're like, oh, I think I get it. Chapter 20, verse eight. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first, that's a flex, y'all. That's John saying, I beat Peter, by the way. <laughs> also went in and saw and believed for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must raise from the dead. The gospel authors are writing about Jesus and they're like, oh my gosh. I get the point of all of it now. That God has a way he intends it to be and we've broken it. And every time we break it, we die. But wait a second, all over this there's sacrifices. And right over there, when Jesus sacrificed himself, they thought they lost him. But then when he rose from the dead, they're like, ah, that's how you get the death out. It cost a lot. I mean, there's a permanent impact on Jesus in his resurrected body. They could observe the scars, couldn't they? He's going to be the only one in heaven with scars. 
And Jesus says, all right, this is what I want you to take to the world. This is what's gonna change it. And so Southwest, you've got a lot to carry on your shoulders this generation because they think they've got the answer and they think the answer is on your cell phone. (laughs) No, it ain't. The answer is what we talked about last week. The new covenant, Jeremiah, that he's written it on your heart. And our job is to become preoccupied and planted with the person, the ministry, the life of Jesus. And that's what our church is about. So when we ask you to be planted, we want you to be planted in these gospels right here. Because we believe he can change the world. Amen? Amen. We got to live it. Jesus, I pray for our church that you would keep bringing us back to the clarity of this. God, I thank you for the fact that we're trying to cover the Bible in five weeks and you still jump to the surface. God, you're so good to us in that way. God, I don't even think we're so smart that uh, two months ago we knew this would happen. But Jesus, here you are again, right in our midst, calling us to you to the way that you're authoritative, to the way that you're wise, to the way that you're truth, to the way that you're God, and in the way that you sacrifice so that you can become savior. And so Jesus, I pray for our church, a high calling. I pray that you would not give up on our focus on you. Jesus, our culture is begging us to obsess over other things. God, I pray that we would prioritize you And engage those things. And in that way, Jesus, I pray that you would change this world. In your name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Because we know they're going to beg you to obsess over it. We pray a blessing over you every week before you leave. So could you stand to your feet? And we're going to pray God's blessing, presence, and favor right over you before we walk out those doors. And then ironically, you're going to think, huh, it was actually cool in there. We stretch out our hands to indicate to God we want this from him. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon each and every one of you and bring you peace. And we pray these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Amen. We'll see you next week.